In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. He was not that light but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world and the world was made by him and the world knew him not. He came unto his own and his own received him not. But as to them that received him, gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe in his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. God is good and all the time good evening everyone how was your day thank god for that mine was also good and i'm eternally grateful to him for that i thank him for life i welcome you i welcome those connecting via facebook and youtube wherever you are we're grateful for your joining this way and may the lord bless you as surely as we believe he will bless us in this place is there anyone present right now who is not a Seventh-day Adventist? Your guest. May I see your hand? You are a guest. You're not an Adventist. Ah, can we get a microphone to our distinguished guest, please? We just want to know his name. Just get a microphone to our guest. We are glad you are here. Ah, there we are. We have a live mic. Okay, right over here, the distinguished gentleman in the black shirt. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Joel. Joel? Yes. As in the Bible, Joel. Yes. Nice to see you, Joel. Where are you from? Uh, west of the cities, a water town, small town, west. Not far from here. Correct. All right. And who invited you? All right. Well, we're very glad you've come. I say that very sincerely. Thank you for being with us, and may the Lord bless you, bless you abundantly. Say amen for Joel, and may the Lord bless your family. I believe there are those online who are also guests, wherever you are. May the Lord place his hand of mercy and generosity upon your lives, and never remove it as long as you live on this earth. Thank you again for being with us. Our subject for tonight, it's already 10 after 7, is get up. Our subject is what? Get up. Before I go any further, please, if you're using one of these, just make sure it does not ring. And let me thank you again that so far, since 7th of August and today is what, the 20th, I have not heard a phone ring in this building. I'm grateful for that and I'm sure so is God who loves reverence. The second favor I ask is that you pray for me while I'm speaking. All I ask you to say is, Lord, put your words in that man's mouth. And the reason why I make this request so consistently, I'm aware that my words cannot save your lives, cannot change your lives. But the words of God will do that. They are designed to do that. Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 9, Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth and the lord said unto me behold i have put my words in thy mouth and i just want to speak his words and keep my opinions strictly to myself favor number three as you listen think it is essential that we think isaiah 118 come now let us reason together saith the lord let's pray father in heaven thank you for life thank you to god for another opportunity in a land where we still enjoy religious freedom to come to this place to worship you in spirit 
but also in truth. We thank you for those who are connecting via the internet, dear God, wherever they are. Reach your hand and touch them. As we bow before you, Father, if there's anything in us you don't like, remove it, I pray, particularly me as the speaker. Cleanse me, I pray, Father, and make me a fit vessel in your hands as I humble myself in your presence. My desire, Father, is to lift you up through the truth. Help me to do that, dear God, because in my own strength I cannot do it. I pray that you'd bless all the countries represented by the listening audience, Father. Direct the minds of the leaders of those countries that their decisions may be righteous ones because your word says righteousness exalteth a nation. And let the words I speak, which I believe will come from you, change someone who's listening, someone who's given up, have little, very, very little hope. Let the words reach that person and claim that person from the depth of despair. We thank you for the presence of Brother Joel. Bless his life in every possible way. And for all those within the sound of my voice in this building on the internet, Father, protect them from the coronavirus. If any one of them has contracted that illness, deliver them, Father. Place your healing hand on them, I pray. Now, dear God, I commit this service to your glory. Accept it, I pray, and bless us in Jesus' name. Amen. Our subject, get up. And it's already 7.15. I think I'll go right up to 8 o'clock. I believe I have to do that tonight. I hope you won't mind too much. I always try to release you before 8, but tonight I'm sure I am going to 8. We will see how that plays out. Let us go to Genesis chapter 3. Well, Genesis chapter 2. We'll read 16 and 17. Genesis chapter 2, reading verses 16 and 17. And I read from the King James Version of the Bible. Genesis 2, 16 and 17. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayst freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. And introduced in the Bible is the concept of death. That's where it is first introduced, as far as books go in their chronological order. In the day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Let us go to chapter 3. We read verse 17. Our subject, get up. Chapter 3 of Genesis, verse 17, the Bible says, And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth unto thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. Verse 19, In the sweat of thy face, shall thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground, for out of it was thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. God tells Adam, when you die, you go back to where you came from, which is dust. Because the Bible tells us in Genesis 2 verse 7, and the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. God told him, when you die, that's where you go to dust. That's the condition of a dead person virtually, dust or a form waiting to decompose back into dust. Now, let's take another look at the condition of a dead person. Let us go to Psalm 30. We read verse 8 and 9. Psalm 30, verses 8 and 9, our subject, get up. I cry to thee, O Lord, and unto the Lord I made supplication. What profit is there in my blood when I go down to the pit? Shall the dust praise thee? Shall it declare thy truth? The, the psalmist is saying, God, what's the point in killing me? How do you profit? Because when I'm dead, I cannot praise you. I cannot preach your truth. Shall the, death, the dead dust praise thee? Shall it declare thy truth? So we're told clearly that in death, the person who has died cannot speak, doesn't know anything. Let's go to Proverbs chapter 9, not Proverbs, sorry. Ecclesiastes 9, we read 5 and 6. Our subject, get up. We're looking at the state 
of the dead, the physical state of the dead. Ecclesiastes 9 verse 5, For the living know that they shall die, but the dead know nothing. Neither have they any more a reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. Also their love and their hatred and their envy is now perished. Neither have they any more a portion forever in anything that is done under the sun. So those two verses tell us the emotional structure of a person ceases to function at death. Their love, their hatred, the entire gamut, which is compassed by those two opposite words, love and hatred. Their envy is now perished. And verse 6 says, they have no participation in anything that happens under the sun. The dead know nothing. They're dead, just dirt. And I speak respectfully because there have been several deaths in my own personal life, relatives and friends. This is the state of a dead person. The person knows nothing, can do nothing. Let's go to Psalm 115, verse 17. Psalm 115 Verse 17. Psalm 115, verse 17. The dead praise not the Lord, neither any that go down into what? Silence, yes. This is just a repetition of what we read in Ecclesiastes 9, 5, and 6, in Psalm 38 and 9. Just a repetition. A dead person knows nothing. The person is lifeless, useless, dead, gone. Now, this physical death is a symbol of spiritual death. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 5, we read verse 7, verse 6, sorry. 1 Timothy 5, verse 6. Our subject, get up. And you'll discover in a while why that's the subject. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 6. You have that? The Bible says, and she that does what? Liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth. Now this is spiritual death, which is a state of deadness as real as physical death. It is spiritual death. There's physical life, but spiritual death. And the Bible says she or he that liveth in pleasure is dead while that person is physically alive. And so we have spiritual death and we have physical death. And physical death symbolizes spiritual death. Let's take another look at death. In 1 Kings 17, no need to go there, Elijah raised the dead son of the widow at Zarephath. That's 1 Kings 17. In 2 Kings, I believe chapter 4, Elisha raised the dead son of the Shunammite widow. We know that Paul raised Eutychus. We know that uh, Peter raised, I think it was Lydia. We know that Jesus raised the young man uh, who was the son of the, the widow of Nain, Luke 7. We know that Jesus, I think I said, raised Lazarus, John 11. In all of these instances, someone else had to raise the dead. Now, if you exempt Jesus Christ, who raised himself, every dead person can only be raised by someone else. A dead person cannot raise himself or herself. And I want to establish that very clearly as I get into the heart and soul of spiritual death. As we continue with, get up. Let me pray again. Father in heaven, please control my mind and my mouth. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. The woman in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 6, she or he that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth. Now, Elisha raised someone, Elijah raised someone, Paul raised someone, Peter raised someone from physical death by the power of God, of course. But none of them ever raised someone from spiritual death. Only God can do that directly. Let me say it again. Only God directly can raise someone from spiritual death. 
So I repeat, she that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth. Go now to Ephesians chapter 2. We'll read from verse 1. Ephesians 2, reading from verse 1, our subject, get up. We looked at death. The dead person knows absolutely nothing. The person just begins to decompose, as was the case of Lazarus after four days in the tomb. We realized, we saw that the dead have no participation in what goes on on earth, despite what some witch doctors may try to tell you. No participation, the person's dead. The person cannot praise God. The person can't speak the truth. The person's emotional makeup is gone. Everything is gone. The person is dead. And that symbolizes spiritual death. Second, uh, not second, Ephesians chapter 2. We'll read from verse 1. Listen carefully. And you hath he quickened. Read the next few verses for me. Who were? dead come on in trespasses and sins this is the precise condition of the woman in first timothy 5 verse 6 she that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth paul tells the church of ephesus you were once dead literally dead spiritually if there's such a combination of words as a person is physically dead dead unable to do anything for himself, a spiritually dead person cannot raise himself or herself. And so Paul writes, and you have he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. This is spiritual death. The question then becomes, how is a spiritually dead person raised? Well, since we began with physical death as a symbol of spiritual death, let's look at how physically dead people are raised. John 11, verse 43, the most famous of all the resurrections, Lazarus. John 11, reading verse 43, our subject, get up. John chapter 11, reading verse 43, is 25 after 7. The Bible says, and when he thus had spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot in grave clothes. Lazarus was raised by the word of God, physically. Let's look at the son of the widow of Nain. Luke 7, let's read verse 14. Luke 7, verse 14, Jesus comes near the city of Nain. There's a funeral procession. There's a dead boy and a mother who was a widow. The boy was probably her only source of support. He's dead. The Bible says in verse 14, And he came and touched the bier, and them that bear him stood still. And he said unto him, What? Young man, I say unto thee, Arise. Young man, I say unto thee, arise. And that word gave life to that young boy. Go to Mark chapter 5. Let's read verse 41. Mark 5, reading verse 41. This time, he's raising a young woman. He raises a young boy in Luke 7, 14. Now he's raising a young girl who was just 12 years old. Mark 5, verse 41. And he took the damsel by the hand and said unto her, Talitha kumi, which is being interpreted, damsel, I say unto thee, arise. And immediately the damsel arose and walked, for she was of the age of 12 years. And they were astonished, with great astonishment. Jesus raised that young girl with his word. He raised that young boy with his word. He raised Lazarus with his word. This is physical resurrection. Let's go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We read from verse 16. Our subject, get up. What did Jesus say to that boy? Young man, I say unto thee, arise, get up. What did he say to the young girl, the dead girl? Damsel, I say unto thee, arise. What did he say to Lazarus? Come forth, same thing. Arise, get up. The word of God. 1 Thessalonians 4, reading from verse 16. Our subject, Get up. You have that? 
For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. That's the word. Not just a, 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 a shout. Even though the word says shout, it means words spoken loudly. With the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, three, these three statements simply mean that when Christ comes back, he speaks loudly. Shout, voice of the archangel, trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Now we know it is not just a shout as a noise because he raised that young boy by saying something specific. He raised that young girl by saying something specific. He raised Lazarus by saying something specific. So we know when he comes a second time to raise and resurrect all the righteous dead from Abel. He just speaks. And all the righteous dead get up. He doesn't touch anyone. Because the Bible says, Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. The Bible is very clear. When Jesus comes back, he does not touch the earth. He hovers somewhere in the atmosphere, raises the dead with a tumultuous voice. He speaks his word. Go to John 6, let's read verse 63, our subject, get up. John 6, verse 63. It's 7.30. I feel confident I'll release you before 8. What book did I say? John. What chapter? 6. What verse? 63. Listen carefully to Jesus. It is the spirit that does what? Quickeneth. What does quicken mean? To make alive. It is the spirit that quickeneth. You know, Romans 8, 1, Jesus said, For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, of verse 2, hath made me free from the law of sin and death. The law of the spirit of life. Jesus says, it is the spirit that quickeneth or gives life. The flesh profiteth nothing. Read microscopically now. The words that I speak unto you. They are spirit. Come on and they are life. The word of God is spirit-filled and it's living. And so Jesus raised Lazarus, the young man from the city of Nain, Jairus' daughter. He speaks, he spoke, and they got up. He will raise all the righteous dead by speaking, and they will come up. That's how he resurrects the physical dead. This physical death is a symbol of spiritual death. We can conclude as we reason through the scriptures, he raises the spiritual dead the same way with his word. Go to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians 5. Let's read from verse 10, 14. Ephesians 5, 14. Wherefore he saith what? Awake thou that do what? Awake thou that sleepest, and Christ shall and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. This is directed at the spiritually dead. Awake! Thou that sleepest and arise from the dead now. And Christ shall give thee light. And light is life. John 1 verse 4. In him was life. And the life was the light of men. John 8 12. I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness. But shall have the light of life. Life is light. Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. Now this is directed at the spiritually dead. He raises the spiritual dead the same way he raises the physical dead. Spoken differently, I'll say it this way. Jesus Christ raises someone in the tomb of addiction with his word. The same way he raises someone in the tomb, as in the case of Lazarus, or lying on the coffin, as in the case of that young man from the city of Nain, he uses his word. In the Desire of Ages, page 320, paragraph 2, 
Desire of Ages, page 320, paragraph 2, Ella White writes, As the word of life, which bade the first man live, still gives us life. In other words, life was spoken into Adam. As the word of life, which bade the first man live, still gives us life. As the words, young man, I say unto thee, arise, still gives life to the one that believes it. In other words, what the author is saying, the same way, young man, I say unto thee, arise, gave life to a physically dead young man, the same words accepted on the spiritual level will change the life of a young man who seems dead in addiction to pornography and masturbation and whatever else. The word of God can raise him from that dead condition. But he has to accept it. But as many as received him, gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. And to believe on God is to surrender body, soul, mind, and spirit, and heart, and understanding, and might, and strength, and mind to what the word of God says. That total surrender brings about a resurrection. The speciality of Jesus is to change lives. And the first action of changing a life is to raise that person from the dead. Jesus Christ did not have to die in order to improve someone. You can do that by yourself. You need not have God's involvement to improve yourself, but in order to change, in order to come from spiritual death into vigorous life, we need God and he communicates that power through his word. And so when he said to that young man, young man, I see into the arise, he is saying it to every young man trapped in some addiction, some life of sin, some older man, some older woman. The word of God is the life-giving agent that Jesus uses to resurrect the spiritual dead. All he requires is that we believe. Let's look at an example of believing and that belief giving life. Let me pray. Father, as I continue, control me, Lord. In every aspect of this presentation, control me. Because I'm here for you, not for me. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Go to Genesis 15. We read from verse 1, an incident in the life of Father Abraham. Biblically, the father of the faithful. He's known for his faith as Job is known for his patience. Genesis 5, Genesis 15, sorry, reading for verse 1. And after these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding reward. And Abram said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me? Seeing I go childless, and this steward of my house is this Elias of Damascus. And he said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in my house is mine heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, verse 4, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven and tell the stars, the word tell means count, if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be now. God is speaking to a man whose wife could not have children. We know that from Genesis 11, verse 30. But Sarai was barren, she had no child. By the way, it's very interesting. God is frequently called the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You read the Old Testament, he's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Those are our three spiritual patriarchs. The those who gave their lives to Christ. Abraham's wife could not have children. Sarah, God had to open her womb. Isaac's wife could not have children. Rebecca, God had to open her womb. Rich, uh, Jacob's wife, Rachel, could not have children. God had to open her womb. Do you understand now we come from a heritage of faith? Because all three men had to have faith in God that they can have children from women who could not have children. To accept Christ is to be a child of Abraham, which makes you a child of faith in what God says. Each one of them, three wives, 
unable to have children until God specially opened the womb at the prayers of the husbands. And so God said to Abraham, this shall not be thine heir, meaning Eliezer, who was a holy man, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels, he meant the womb of Sarah, shall be thine heir. Now go to Romans chapter 4. We read from verse 19. Our subject, get up. And the best way to get up is to fall down at the feet of Jesus. Romans chapter 4, reading from verse 19. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. Let's pause. We're looking at death and we're looking at the power to resurrect that dead. The Bible says Abraham, he'd come to the point, his loins were dead. You know exactly what that means. His wife, her womb was dead, nothing productive from that womb. The Bible says, in being not weak in faith, despite the deadness of his womb, loins and the deadness of Sarah's womb, Abraham believed, thus said the Lord. This is surrender to what the word of God says. This is how the spiritual dead are raised, a total submission to God's word. You looked at his dead loins, that's not a problem. His, the dead woman is his wife. That's not a problem because the triumph is in thus saith the Lord. He staggered not at the promise of God in unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. Verse 21 of Romans 4, being fully persuaded. I thank God for those two words. Fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also, come on, finish the verse. To perform now. Young man listening to me somewhere on YouTube, Facebook, you're by yourself. Young lady, you're by yourself. Older man, older woman, you're caught up with this addiction. Abraham's condition was probably worse than yours. Dead loins, dead womb, and from dead loins, and dead womb came living Isaac. Somebody say amen. Why? Because the word said so. And Abraham believed it. He believed against the impossible. You're listening to me. You probably have given up ever being delivered from this condition you're in. Don't do that. Believe that what God has promised He's able to perform. And what his promise is that he is able to raise the spiritual dead. God can deliver you and raise you from that tomb and that mausoleum of addiction and whatever else has your life cursed. God can raise you up and deliver you and give you life. But you've got to believe it. You've got to believe God can break you free of cigarettes. You have to believe it. You believe it by submitting to this word. When God told Abraham he'd have a son, you read Genesis 17, Abraham laughed at God. Genesis 17, verse 17. You read Genesis 18, is Sarah laughed. So both man and woman laughed because they, were, they had not yet come to the point of faith maturity. You understand? Because we grow. But it did come to that point. We looked at Abraham. Let's look at Sarah and the strength of her faith. Let's go to Hebrews 11. We read from verse 8 our subject, get up. Hebrews 11, reading from verse 8. 20 minutes to 8. And let me slow down. When I get excited, I go too quickly. That's not good. I hope someone has prayed for me and said, Lord, put your words in that man's mouth. You can see I need it. What book did I say? Hebrews, what chapter? 11, what verse 8? By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive as an inheritance, obeyed. And he went out, not knowing whither he went. By faith, he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. By faith, he sojourned in the land of Canaan, as in a strange country. Now, God had promised that land to him. 
Even though he moved from place to place, he never lost the consciousness, one day this will be mine. By faith, he sojourned in the land of promise. And a promise is something said. Are you with me? A promise is something said. And so he sojourned in the land of promise, the land of the word of God, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. Verse 9, for he looked for a city which had foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Verse 12, through faith also, through what? Faith also, Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age because she'd what? Judged him faithful who had promised Sarah came to the place where she had unconquerable faith in the word of God. I am unable to have children. I am past the age of productivity and fertility, but God said I'll have a child and I submit entirely to that word and she had a child. A dead womb, dead loins. From the deadness of what you consider a hopeless situation, God can raise you up. That's his speciality. He does it through his word. And so tonight, God is saying to a young man, a young lady, you're about to get into this behavior that has really broken you spiritually. He's saying to you, as he said to that young man, arise. He's saying to you, young lady, as he said to Tyrus' daughter, arise get up wherefore he saith awake thou that sleepest and arise from the dead arise receive that word into your heart and watch your life change it is the word of resurrection believe it but notice what Philip told the Ethiopian eunuch go to Acts 7 not Acts 7 sorry Acts 8 you know the story of the Ethiopian eunuch who was reading the Bible in his chariot? He did not know what he was reading, so Philip explained it was Christ he was reading about because he was reading Isaiah 53. Verse 36, And as they went on the way, they came unto a certain water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest how, Come on, tell me. Tell me if thou believest how, With all thine heart, thou mayest if you believe with all your heart this is what God wants Abraham came to the place where he believed with all many many years ago I worked in a uh, a home where troubled boys were placed they couldn't live at home and the courts assigned them to these places and I would work a certain shift and make sure they behaved themselves and took the medication and went to school whatever else and one day we had a, a team building, trust building exercise. And here's the way it went. Step up a little higher, if it does not ruin the camera shot. The boys all stood in two lines, along with staff members. There were about seven in this line, seven in that line. And they linked their hands like this. And held them down. Now I stood on a chair facing backward. What was I supposed to do? <laughs> fall back. Now it's one thing to fall watching, then I could put my hands down. Now these are boys whose behavior was such they couldn't live at home. Are you following me? <laughs> I am supposed to just fall back. Believing what? They'll catch me. I'm so grateful they did. God's word. The hand of God and the hand of Jesus like this. This is you. God says, you see that tree? I made it with my word. You see that sky? I made it with my word. <laughs> you see the ground you're standing on? I made it with my word. Now my word says, if you fall back, I'll catch you. You fall back. That's the faith God wants. You don't fall back like this. You say, Jesus, could you shift your hands? You fall back. Why? Because the word says, fall back. Tonight, the word says, young man, I say unto thee, arise. The word says, damsel, young lady, I say unto thee, arise. And God is saying, get up from that condition of spiritual death. But the getting up is based upon receiving the word into your heart. That word, young man, I say unto thee, arise, will resurrect you if you receive it with all your heart. 
That's what Jesus came to do. That word will lift you from the fumes of alcoholism and the miasma of smoke and marijuana if you will receive it into your heart and not doubt. Doubt is deadly. Faith is life. And so tonight, God says to you, get up. We look up for one final Bible passage and I pray. Go to John chapter 5. Our subject, get up. John 5, let's read from verse 1. John chapter 5, reading from verse 1. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a vast multitude of impotent folk of blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then first, after the troubling of the water, stepped in was made whole of whatsoever disease he had. And a certain man was there, which had an infirmity 30 and 8 years. How long have you been trapped in this condition, this behavior, this sin? 30 and 8 years when Jesus saw him lie and knew he had been now a long time in that case, in that condition. He said unto him, Will thou be made whole? Do you want your condition changed? Now, this was the same person who said, Let there be light. He's saying it to you. Do you want your condition changed? The impotent man answered him, verse 7 of John 5, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool, but while I'm coming, another sits down before me, all kinds of excuses. Jesus just said, do you want to be made whole? Do you want to break that addiction? Jesus said unto him, rise, take up thy bed, and walk. Now, Jesus didn't touch him. He was physically sick. But whether you're physically sick or spiritually sick, the healing is in the same word. Can you say amen? It's in the same word. Rise, take up thy bed, and walk. And immediately the man was made whole and took up his bed and walked. He received what Jesus said and started to get up. Jesus did not lift him. He received it. He believed it. He willed to walk. It's a very curious thing. There's something called home court advantage. Ever heard of it? Yes, you have. A basketball team, a baseball team, a football team, a hockey team, they invariably win most of the games where? At home. They go on the road and they lose. Same people. But it's a psychological effect. We can't lose at home. This is home court. You've got to defend it. The weakest teams win most games at home. Well, put your faith in this. Get up, says Christ. Receive that get up, young man, young lady, into your heart. 100% and watch your life.